Welcome to the Revolution Church message series, The Greatest Commandment. You can find the entire series in video and podcast format, as well as other messages at firstloverevolution.com. Here's Pastor Shane with today's message. Uh, It's good to be with you. Welcome, everyone. I'm so glad that you guys came to worship this weekend. Also, a special hello uh, to those of you in Colorado Springs and those of you watching from Mexico City as well, and uh, to all of you online. It's great to be with you. I'm looking forward to continuing our series on the greatest commandment. When Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? commandment. He didn't hesitate to answer. He said it's to love the Lord your God with all of your heart and your soul and all of your mind and all of your strength. He even went on to say that um, this is the first and greatest commandment. And, you know, this right here is our purpose in life. And we've been talking about this a lot. It's what we're called to do. It's who we're called to be. It is our mission. Above all else, this is why we exist. It's what we were created for. It's why we are alive, to love the Lord our God with all that we are and all that we have. And as I've been learning in Mexico, that they would say to, to love him con todo and uh, it's very exciting uh, with all people a uh, con todo people are raising up in in mexico city and it's such an awesome thing can i share a couple updates with you guys uh, if you're brand new with us the short story is that god has called us to walk by faith uh, out upon the water so to speak over the last couple of months and we have been witnessing this miracle unfold as we have Uh, back in mid-november we heard the lord say to plant a revolution church campus in mexico city somewhere i had never been our team had never been and so we went down the week before christmas okay we're talking weeks ago uh we didn't have a pastor we didn't have a place to meet uh we didn't have the money to do this we we didn't have a people to plant a church with and when i say we didn't have a we didn't have a people okay we didn't know anyone no one we didn't have a contact or a relationship on the ground as we were boarding the plane but most of you have probably heard the story that even by the time we came back god provided a pastor and a place within one week it is absolutely insane what he has done but not only that he has continued to raise up what he is has in his heart to do as we just continue to walk by faith you know we don't have a playbook for what we're doing i'm not going to pretend like we have a strategy or any smarts or that we know what we're doing we don't all we know to do is just do whatever he tells us to do and so that's what we've been doing to our best ability and he's not only raised up a pastor he's raised up a a whole team of pastors uh he's not only raising up a people he's raising up a fantastic uh people whose hearts are burning for what he wants to do here's a picture of the core team gathering that just happened on friday evening and i'm telling you that upper room room in that facility was like standing room only by the time everybody uh, showed up. Um, Mexico, they may not be quite as punctual uh, as we are in the United States, I'm learning, but nevertheless, uh, we're going to have to move it into the worship center as soon as possible. And while you cannot see this through the pictures, I just have to tell you, his presence is so strong in those meetings. I mean, hearts are burning, eyes are filled with tears. He is calling people, often on first encounter with this vision, he's calling people to it and they're coming in there, like sacrificing for what he wants to do. I also shared last week that we didn't have the money to do what God was calling us to do either. So we had to, we would need to raise at least 500,000 to purchase a facility and 550,000 to cover all the startup and launching costs of launching a church in the first year of operating expenses uh, because when you're starting a church you got to give them some room to be able to become self-sustaining and the lord has done all of that too all of this in just a matter of weeks and i want to give you a little update so here was the worship center um when we purchased the facility it was a a cooking school uh or as i like to call it it was a house of bread um before it's become a different type of house of bread look how much work they have already done over the last several days clearing all of that out getting it ready um, to become a worship center starting on monday they're going to begin painting that worship center Uh, on top of all that there's this other incredible 
global miracle, God led us to start a new nonprofit organization called the English Advantage, which would serve that community by teaching English and making it available to the under-resourced populations living in the area. You're seeing the website. Steve Sandy from our church developed that website for us for free. Again, God provides. Praise the Lord. Um, we already have one English teaching missionary, Jillian Smith. She's been raising support to be able to go, and she's moving in just a couple of weeks to be the native English teacher. Uh, we have really learned that around the world, as English has become the global business language, having access to many types of jobs is given by having a certain level of proficiency in the English language. And this exists to be able to make that affordable uh, to those that cannot afford the expensive language schools that usually only the elite of society are able to get into. God's opened such an incredible door through the English Advantage. We were able to have two different meetings with rooms full of uh, teachers and principals. Uh, they were so excited to hear uh, what we were going to be coming to do to serve this community. They were just blown away by the programs that are going to be available, uh, that they'll be taught by a native English speaker, um, and that it's not there to make money off of the people, but it's there to help empower and um, you know, educate the people to have access uh, that they wouldn't have access to uh, as it is. So please uh, be praying actually that God's going to provide a second English teaching missionary very soon because he's opened a door bigger than we anticipated and uh, we're going to have more demand than we have the ability to supply. Uh, but I was very proud to tell these schools after the presentation that, you know, the the truth and full transparency is that we are pastors and the reason we're here is because we were sent by God and we understand that the English Teaching School is a non-religious, non-profit uh, association, but they now know the church is behind this and we believe that we've been sent by the Lord to help serve their community and it will absolutely change people's lives, giving them uh, local employment opportunities that they do not have access to. The studies show really all around the world, this is one of the best ways to protect the vulnerable um, from being having to commute long distances to take on rural jobs because it will give them access to local office jobs because long commutes are one of the primary causes of abductions, assaults, trafficking, things of that nature. So please keep this work also uh, in your prayers and the whole thing. Also be keeping the new campus pastor Elie Sama there in your prayers. You know that this has caught the enemy's attention and uh, so certainly there's a target on him as well. But God is really doing a work. And he's not only doing a work there. I want to remind you, he, he called us to plow the field of impossibility at all three campuses, at all three locations, Lone Tree, Colorado Springs, and also Mexico City. He gave us specific goals that also were just and are just as impossible. Uh, for Lone Tree, the goal was to see... 24-7 worship grow to be live in five, meaning a live worship leader and at least five people present, including the live worship leader, for 100 hours of the week by the end of the 100-day miracle, which is April 17th. For Colorado Springs, he gave something just as impossible, and that was to see a hundred unique intercessors raise up who'd be willing to intercede at least one hour a week. I mean, these are all absolutely wild things. And I want to encourage you to keep praying that God would receive everything that he has revealed is in his heart to be able to do. I sense the reason God called us to pray for such a massive increase in 24-7 prayer, uh, primarily coming through the Colorado Springs campus and 24-7 worship, primarily coming through the Lone Tree campus, is because the engine needs a massive upgrade. As God is leading us into the territory he is leading us in, we're going to need more of his grace, more of his power, more of his presence and his favor than ever before. These are not just goals for the sake of having goals. I believe that these are God-given goals and that they matter and they really matter now. And so I want to encourage you, keep praying that he would do the thing that is impossible to be done uh, here and there and everywhere because a first love revolution is beginning. Amen. So thank you, God, and way to go, Revolution Church. 
Um, just for fun, I should also share, I got to uh, share a birthday celebration uh, with our campus pastor down there, Eli Sama, and I learned that when Mexicans do piñatas, man, they do it a little uh, uh, differently than we do, and it's pretty crazy, because I got out there, I took my one little swing, and I was like, oh, I guess my turn's over, here you go. He's like, no, that's not how we do it. We keep swinging until the song ends, and so he went out, and he kind of showed me how it's done, and I'm like, man, that's actually kind of dangerous, but you know, uh, go and get it. Um, so you can see that amidst a lot of work, we also had a lot of fun. Praise the Lord, but back to our series, The Greatest Commandment. There is no question about what. There's no question about what we're called to do. There is a question of how, like how do we live out this high calling? How do we live the mission with every decision. I think if all of us were honest, we would admit to the same thing. We're incapable of doing this. And I'll just be the first to go on record. It is not possible for me to love God with all of me, even for a second without his help, much less a day or a year and certainly a lifetime. I just cannot do that, but I want to. You know, I want to do that. I want to get to the end of my life. And I want to know that what I did mattered according to the one who defines what matters. I want to get to the end of my life and know that I made much of the grace that God had given to me. Uh, that I gave my life to the thing that God said matters most. And that is what this series is all about. It's about pressing beyond concept and pressing into practicality. So far in this series, we have spent the majority of our time talking about the first part. What does it mean to love God with all of our heart? What does that mean? Scripture says in Proverbs 4.23, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. And so naturally, we are spending a little extra time on what it looks like to love God with all of our hearts. So far, we've focused on what this means, that first, the heart is the center of our desire, biblically. It's, it's, it's about what we want. It's about what we prize in our hearts. That is first and foremost, to love him with all of our heart is for him to actually be the desire of our heart, the prize of our heart. Second, we've talked about what the affection and passion aspect is of loving God with all of our hearts from a biblical standpoint, learning what it means to actually tend to the fire within, to kindle the fire within. Today, we're going to be talking about loving God with all of our hearts one more time, but this time a little bit less about what it means. And this time we're going to be addressing the primary thing that will get in the way of your capacity to love God with all of your heart. This is the greatest fire suppressant of the soul we're looking at today. Uh, and we're going to be looking at the parable of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. So if you have your Bibles, um, you know, digitally or, you know, old fashioned paper Bibles, go ahead and open up there with me uh, as we look at Luke 15, starting in verse 11. And I'll read uh, verse 11 and 12. Jesus said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. And so he divided his wealth between them. Now, in truth, this is a particularly popular parable of Jesus. If you've been a Christian for even a short period of time, if you have any Christian background, you most likely have certainly heard this one. And if you've been going to church your whole life, this is one of the passages you may have heard more sermons on than maybe any other passage. It is a very popular passage. The younger son in context is asking the father for his future inheritance, but he wants it right now. And the father actually agrees to go ahead and give it to him right now. But then he goes away. He basically runs off to Vegas and he squanders the whole thing in gambling and wild living. Uh, eventually he is impoverished and he comes to his senses and he's like, man, my father's hired servants. They're now better off than I am. And so he decides to go back to his father intending to become one of those hired servants. Um, but while he's still a long ways off, 
His father, who's surveying the scene, he actually sees him coming. In the parable, he runs out to him. He embraces him. He puts a robe on him. He puts a, a ring on his finger. And, and, you know, he throws this feast to celebrate his homecoming. So knowing that context and, and the background and the setup for the story, uh, we might imagine that we're going to primarily focus on the younger son uh, to learn about loving God with all of our hearts. But actually, we're going to look at the older son. Uh, let's drop down to verse 25 of the story it says now his older son was in the field and when he came and approached the house he heard music and dancing now when we read that the older son is in the field it seems like a good sign okay like he's out in the field you know like despite what his brother has done this brother is staying the course he's literally about his father's business this is an agricultural field that he's out in he seems like he's aligned to the father's heart, that he's aligned to the, the father's priorities until we look at what comes next. Luke 15, verse 26, and he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. So the older brother, Jesus says, summons one of his father's servants. Uh, this word for servants uh, is significant. Uh, if you're here for any short period of time, really, you'll learn that every single word in the pages of God's word is incredibly significant. This word is from the Greek word pais, and it means, it's an interesting word because sometimes it means a child, other times it means a slave. It can mean a child or a slave, and so it's unusual in that way. And when it's referring to a slave, it's a word for when a servant or a slave has become like a son to the master. Whenever we see this word in the context of slave, we will see it used in this very affectionate way, like when the man came to Jesus and he said, my servant is sick, would you come and heal him? He says, my pious, he's sick, would you come and would you heal him? And so Jesus uses this term to refer to the servants or the slaves of this master, showing that the heart the master has for his servants is the heart of like a father to a son. And with that in mind, let's go back to verse 17 and 18 of the story to what the younger prodigal son said whenever he hit rock bottom. It says, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I'm dying here with hunger. I'm going to go up and go to my father and say, father, you know, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. So both Jesus and the son here are referring to the same group of people, but they are not using the same word to refer to the same group of people. When Jesus references the servants, he uses the term pice, the term that we just talked about. But when the younger son describes the father's servants, he doesn't use the same word. He uses a different word. It's mystheos, which is the word for a, a wage earner. And so verse 26 actually shows what these servants actually were. They were counted like sons to the father who's also the master. But this younger son, he thinks of them and he sees them as wage earners. Then on the heels of saying that, the younger son goes on to say, verse 18, I'm going to get up and go to my father, say, I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Would you make me as one of your hired men? So he's saying, I'm no longer worthy to be counted as your son, but could I be worthy to receive a wage. And I think we kind of assume this is a good thing. And yes, there is a good thing that's happening in this. But do you notice what's missing? He's still missing the heart of the father. Even now for the son, the emphasis isn't on the character of his father. It's on what the son could be deserving of. So the younger son has taken a shift at this point, but there's still this common denominator and it's deservingness because he believed he deserved the estate simply because he was a son before but now he doesn't think he deserves what a son gets I guess he already took everything that he thought a son deserved but now he wants to be a wage earner one who could at least deserve a wage but it's still about deservingness it's true both terms a pious servant and a mystheos wage earner they convey that they're both in service to 
the father in service to this master, but the wage earners and the pice servants, um, yes, they both did work for and they both belonged to him, but a pice reveals something about the heart of the master. That wage earner does not reveal. And here's what we need to see in this parable, this whole passage, the focus of both sons, the older son and the younger son, they're both focused on this one thing, deserving this. The younger son, it's about deservingness because he's a son. The older son, it's deservingness because of what I've done. And even when the younger son comes back, although he recognizes like some level of my deservingness has been lost, but maybe I could become one who earns a wage. I could become deserving of a wage. You see, all throughout this story, both sons relate to the father based upon deservingness. Pay attention to the fact that the older son is out in the field He's doing what a good son does. And he comes back and he's just appalled at how undeserving his younger brother is. And yet what the father is doing. And notice who it is that is the person that the older brother goes to whenever he hears these sounds of dancing and singing and all of this. He doesn't go straight to the father. This is significant. He goes to a servant to ask about what's going on. You'd expect that he'd just go straight to his dad. What's going on here? But instead we see him staying at a distance. You see, deservingness distances us from grace. It always will. In fact, deservingness sees grace and it's, it's repelled by it. Deservingness sees grace and it's appalled by grace, just even hearing the sounds of grace. He goes to a servant. He doesn't go to his father. Let's pick up with verse 26 again. And he summoned one of the servants and he began inquiring, what are these things? Music and dancing and celebrating and some kind of parties going on? I'm going to inquire about this. The Greek word for inquiring, it's puntanomai. It's, it's this is what you do when you... You, something's foreign to you, something's unknown to you. You begin to inquire about it. And I think that's significant because the older brother surveys the scene of grace and he's like, I'm trying to understand what this is. He's trying to come to grips with this. He's trying to get a grasp on what this thing is as if it's some kind of a foreign thing. Instead of surveying the scene and saying, well, whatever's going on, this is just my dad being who my dad is. Instead, he's like, what is this? Like, I can't think of one possible reason why someone's deserving what's happening to my ears. You see, grace is a foreign thing for the one that has deservingness in their heart. And then the servant responds to his inquiring. So the brother's inquiring of the servant about what in the world's dad up to over there. And then the servant responds, and look at how he responds to this brother of his master. He said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he's received him back, safe and sound. All of this is significant. Your brother, your father, he has received him back. The servant doesn't say, hey, um, uh, your father's <coughs> other son. He doesn't like distance from him. He says, your brother to him, the servant knows the grace of his master, who is this brother's father. He sees the, he knows that the, the father sees the younger son through the lens of grace, and the servant understands all this. And so this is a big contrast, the servant to the two brothers in this story. But I'm pretty sure the older one was thinking at this point, like, well, what brother? What do I have to do with him? He's no longer a son. He's not my brother. He's not doing what makes him deserving of being called a son. But the fact that the servant says your brother, when he knows that he's done nothing of what the older brother has, shows that the servant understands the relationship to the father is not based on that. It is not based on deservingness. And then after he says your father, your father, he says to this brother. See, the focus of this servant is on the father. On what the son's return means for the father. On what the son's return brings to 
the father. Listen, you can actually tell that this servant's heart is full of love for the master who is their father because he is thinking through the lens of what it means for him. And I'm just going to tell you, whenever God becomes the first love of our heart, one of the ways we can detect it is we will start to see things through that lens. Here's what it means for him. This is what, why it's significant to him. This is what this is bringing to him. And the servant, he is doing that even though the brothers are not. And then the servant says that the father has killed the fattened calf because he's received back his son safe and sound. Notice the servant didn't say that the calf was for the younger brother. He says the calf is for this father's celebration, which lines up with what the father himself said. Back in verse 23, bring the fattened calf, kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. He didn't say, hey, I want you to kill the fattened calf and give it to the younger brother so he can eat it by himself or with anyone else that he wants to, you know, eat it with, his friends or whatever. No, the calf is actually not something that's just being given to the son. The calf is for the father's celebration. It's the same as when Jesus said in many other places, enter into the joy of your master. That's what this is all about. And the servant recognizes that. The servant can see that the father father is inviting everyone to enter into his joy. And the one who loves, the one who loves this master, who's become like a father to him, he sees everything through this lens of what it means to the father. And he's celebrating because his son came back to him. Now what we're going to see is that's not how the other son interprets it. Pay close attention to the source of contention. What are the very next words out of the son's mouth? He became angry and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began pleading with him. But he answered and he said to his father, look, for so many years, I have been serving you. And I've never neglected a command of yours. And yet you've never even given me, given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes. You killed the fattened calf for him. Wow, there's a lot going on here, isn't there? When the elder brother says to his father in verse 29, I've been serving you, he uses the verb for slaving. It would be like more literally like slaving away would be the way we would say it. It's not the word pious here. However, it's do you owe. Duluo is the verb form of doulos, which is the normal word for a slave. Now, both of these words, pais and doulos, are and can be translated as slave, and rightfully so. Uh, doulos is the normal word for a slave. It emphasizes the role of being a slave. Pais emphasizes that the master of the slave um, looks at the slave like a son. That they're like a son to them. So the son says, um, I, I, not that I've been picing for you, but I've been doulossing for you. I've been slaving away. And then he adds for so many years. So the, the emphasis and the focus for this older brother in every way is on what I have done. And then he even adds, and I've never disregarded any commandment of yours. If you wonder what self-righteousness means, we're definitely getting a picture of it here. The son sees the father in such a way that he believes he is deserving. And the result is that he's essentially saying, well, I've loved you, but you haven't loved me. You can see how deserving this completely poisons the heart from love. Because it repositions the whole relationship with God away from grace. Away from love. And into the domain of deservingness. And out of that kind of mindset, he's interpreting everything the father's doing wrongly. He interprets the fattened calf as not being about the father's celebration, but he sees it instead as an injustice. This is something the father has given to his brother, done for his brother, but his brother is undeserving of. When you do not know the love of God, you will pervert and distort the grace of God in this way. Your heart will be hard, your eyes will be blind to seeing what this means for him. Why this is significant. 
to him and then responding according to his perspective. Notice this, the son says, you've never even given me a young goat and he gets a fat calf. It's like a way of saying, you've never even given me like a skimpy, scrawny little baby goat. And then you give him the choicest, fattest, most delectable piece of meat we have. That's so distorted. Again, no one ever said the dad was giving the animal to the brother. In fact, the fattened calf was actually for the older brother to come in and to eat and to celebrate with his father. We read that the father was pleading for him to come in and and to do what? Eat the fattened calf. The father wanted him to come in, to enter into his joy and to celebrate with him. But the older brother could not love his father in this moment. And he didn't love his father in this moment. In this moment, we learn the goal of the older brother wasn't to be with the father. The goal of the older brother wasn't to please his father. His father's joy was not the prize of the older brother's heart in any way. You see, to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, you actually have to have the love of God in your heart. And what we're seeing in this parable is that the number one toxin to the heart And its capacity to know, receive, and be filled with love. It's deserving this. It's just game, set, match. When it becomes about deserving this, what I'm worthy of because of what I've done, what I am worthy of because of who I am, why I am worthy or even why I'm not worthy, it all positions the heart in such a way that it poisons the heart to the love of God. And in poisoning the heart to be able to know the love of God, it poisons the heart to be able to love God. This is really true in any relationship when it becomes about deservingness. It's now a transactional relationship. It's like, oh, well, you treat me well. That's me getting what I deserve. And then when you don't, you're not giving me what I deserve. We need to be so aware of this because as our country is following rapidly in the footsteps of Europe who preceded us, of Christian nations becoming post-Christian nations. You are very aware, statistically, that we have been swiftly moving in that direction. And because of that, this language of worthiness and deservingness has infiltrated our society. These are not, this is not a Christian way of talking. The, The language of deservingness and worthiness is not Christian speak. But as our country's been moving away from Christianity, it's infiltrated the society. And it's no accident that in the wake of that, it's become statistically true. Now more than half of all marriages in our country end in divorce. I know divorce is a painful topic because so many have experienced this, pulling your heart and your families apart. But we need to acknowledge, well, of course, I know there's many reasons for divorce, but of course, we're going to be at the highest statistic point of divorce in our history because when it's all about deservingness, there's no love. It's true in any relationship. And it's infinitely true in our relationship with God because literally every single thing from God is mercy. And then grace on top of mercy, meaning, biblically, nothing (laughs) that God gives us is deserved. It's all undeserved. And more than that, it's grace. He's actually giving to us the opposite of what we truly deserve. I mean, it's lavish love. Even that God would allow us to minister to him, to serve him. It's it's mercy. It's who am I? I would be chosen to be a, a servant of the eternal God. And the one who knows that ends up being filled with love for God. Because they know he loves me so lavishly. They're filled with love to love him back. The one who perceives that they deserve, they misinterpret everything that God does as if it's a wage. Why do we love God? According to scripture, 1 John 4, 9, we love because he first loved. But a wage isn't love. I've never seen any of y'all come throw yourselves at the altar in gratitude, you know, Just thank you, thank you, thank you for my boss. He gave me my paycheck this week. That's a wage. 
Only the servant seems to get this in this passage. The sons do not. And so we never read about this older brother even responding to the begging, the imploring of his father. And the the whole parable ends so abruptly. We never read about this brother entering into the celebration of his father. We don't read about him actually entering into the joy of his master, which if you understand the significance of that, it should cause us to be alarmed. The one who thought if anyone would enter into the joy of his father, that it would be him because he was so deserving, never does. You can't get in by deserving this, if you know what I'm saying. The servant said to him, your brother, but when the older brother speaks to his father, he doesn't say my brother, he says this son of yours. He's not receiving the message. It's just another way of saying I'm not willing to accept him being defined as my brother because of your grace for him. No way. Don't miss that earlier in the parable, it says the father had divided in half everything whenever the younger son came and asked for his inheritance early, which means the older son is now perceiving, well, everything left then is mine. He already took his half. So the older brother is actually looking at this and thinking, well, you're taking what's mine. And you're giving it to him, which means he's making the same mistake that the younger brother made. It's only making the injustice greater in his mind instead of saying, all that I have is from you. I mean, everything I have, it's yours anyway. He says, you're robbing me to reward him. You're taking what I am due to actually give to him what he's not due. You're taking what I deserve because of what I've done, what I've earned, and you're giving it to him Because you perceive he's entitled simply because he's your son. The parable of the prodigal son should really be called the parable of the two sons who both got it completely wrong in the exact same way while looking entirely different, but no one would remember it. Both of them are entitled. Both of them are deserving, but for very different reasons. One, I'm entitled because I'm a son. The other, I'm entitled because of what I've done. And the younger son even later, well, I'll be entitled because I'll earn a wage. Essentially saying, I'll be entitled for the reason my older brother's entitled because of what I've done. Neither grasps grace. But look at how the father responds. Verse 31, he said to him, son, you've always been with me and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice for this brother of yours. He was dead and he's come to life. He was lost and he's been found. Now these are the keys to breaking free from a heart that is poisoned by deservingness, the father first calls him son. Son here is the Greek word technon. This is not the normal word for a son either, especially an adult son. Usually when we see technon, it's, a, it's not just child, it's a very young child. The normal word for son is huios. A technon is, is a word for a child. It literally means to be in full dependence upon. That's why it's used of really young children. The father calls him Technon, son. The father is emphasizing that the son who thinks he is deserving is actually a son who is in full dependence upon his father. The son wants to define himself also based upon what he's done because that's where he finds his worth and his merit and his worthiness. But the father is defining him in relationship to himself, son. And of course, he's gently correcting him, calling him a technon, because being fully dependent on 
is not deserving of. And then he continues just to work to redirect the heart of his son. He says, you've always been with me. See, the father is answering abnormally based on what the son just said, right? It's like, it's kind of an odd way to answer. God often answers this way because he sees what's going on a layer down, two layers down, three layers down. He's actually addressing what's really driving us at a subconscious heart level more than the words themselves. That's what's happening here in the parable. You've always been with me. You see, the father is not answering. He's redirecting because it emphasizes the major breakdown that's happened between the relationship between the father and the older son. He's showing that the father's presence has not been the son's desire. That being with him has not been the son's ambition. And the point of that in the parable is this, the presence of God doesn't matter much unless you love him. His presence will never mean much to you. You might hear people talking about his presence. Oh, I just want to be wherever he is. I want to be in his presence. It won't matter much. If you don't love him. I know there's a few insane extroverts. They just like to be around anybody. It don't matter what it is, who it is. Generally speaking, though, we like to be around those in the presence of those that we love. We prize the presence of those that we love. And the father in saying this, he's really revealing to the son that this older son doesn't love his father. He's defining all he's done as love, but that's not love. And the father says to his older son, all that I have is yours. Which of course is emphasizing, <clears throat> all this is, is mine, but also I, I give all to you. It's emphasizing the generosity of the father not the son's deservingness. In so many ways, the father, he's emphasizing his goodness to him, his, his presence to him, his grace, his generosity, while the son is stuck on his own deservingness. Every single word just dripping with significance, but the bottom line of it all is that deservingness, either of what we've done or what we haven't done, it is the death of a relationship of love. Love doesn't live there in the land of deservingness. If the serpent can sink his fangs into your heart and inject one profoundly deadly poison, this is what it would be, deservingness. It's game, set, match. You see, love cannot be received once that bite sinks in. His heart can't know love. It'll be unable to receive his love. Unable to perceive his love. And then we'll be unable to be filled with the heart of love to love him back. But God can change that. Many of you are avid hikers. You love the mountains. If you hike a lot, you've probably carried a saw your extractor kit. You know if the snake bite poison gets into your bloodstream, you need it needs to get sucked out, it needs to get pulled out 
quickly. But you know, the power of God can just extract that. That's my prayer for today. That he would actually do that. So that in place of the poison of deserving is filling our hearts. The love of God could be poured into our hearts. That's my prayer. I'm going to invite Leah up at Colorado Springs to lead through our response time. Let's all pray together. And as we come to the Lord, I want to encourage this church to ask him to do what he is capable of doing, to show any measure of the poison of deservingness that has gotten into the heart. And would you ask him to extract it? Would you break off your agreement with it? Because it's a lie. Just confess, I've agreed with this. I've partnered with this and I've allowed it to fill my heart and I'm recognizing in this moment by your Holy Spirit that it blocks me from being able to receive more of your love, to know your love at a greater height and depth and width. But I want to know your love. It's a time to come and say, God, I recognize that deservingness is a barrier. It's a barricade to being able to receive your love and you just let him know I know I don't deserve your love I confess that now but I do want to know your love come and ask let him know I don't deserve your infinite goodness your infinite grace your infinite generosity your infinite love but God I want to love you with a whole heart and I'm realizing now that means I need to have your love flow into my whole heart Is there any place your love hasn't flowed into because of deservingness? Would you take that out of my heart that your love would flow in? This is a time where you want to come before the Lord and you want to think of your heart like a bowl, but not a lofty, tall, pridefully decorated bowl, just this humble, simple, lowly, wide bowl. Clay. You say, God, here's my heart. Why would you pour the gold and glory of your love into this humble, simple vessel? But I'm reminded that your word says that we, we hold this glory in jars of clay so that the all-surpassing glory of our God would be put on display. This is what I want. I'm setting my heart out. Would you fill it? with a revelation of your love today. God, I'm praying you to open hearts, eyes, ears, minds. Grant power, I ask Holy Spirit, come right now, grant power to grasp a greater height and depth and width of your love. As you're praying and as you're responding to the Lord as he leads and, and you're here and you'd say, I've never known the love of God. I want to share good news with you. God loves you. He made you for a relationship with him that he would pour his love into you, that you would have something to pour back out to him in this never ending eternal relationship. It's good news. And you say, well, why don't I feel that? Well, God reveals that in his word. We have this problem, the problem is called sin, and our sin separates us from this relationship with God because God is a sinless God, he's a holy God. Sin can be in unity with God no more than darkness can exist on the surface of the sun. We do need our sins to be dealt with and so many try like the older brother to, to make things right by being good enough, but the problem isn't outweighing our sin with our good deeds. We actually need our, our sins to be washed away entirely. We need to be made holy. That's the standard to be in relationship with God. That's not a standard I can meet. That's not a standard you can meet. But God in his love for you met that standard. Jesus Christ came and lived a sinless life. And God in his love for you 
he also paid the consequence of our sin, which is death, separation from the source of life, which is God himself. Now that's love. He came, he lived, he died, he rose from the grave, promising life in place of death for all who would receive him by faith. You can't earn it, but the way you receive this gift is you put your faith in Jesus for who he is, Lord and Savior. You choose to trust him to be your Lord and your Savior. If you're here and you've never known the love of God in that way, but you want to. If you're here and you, you lack peace that you're reconciled into a relationship with this perfect holy God, but you want to leave this room with that peace, I want to give you a chance to do that with heads bowed and eyes closed. If you're here and you would say, hey, I admit that I've sinned and I do believe that Jesus Christ came and he died and he rose so that I could be forgiven and have eternal life in relationship with God. And I'm willing to receive him for who he is in my life as my Lord and as my Savior. If that's you, again, heads bowed, eyes closed. If that's you, would you just raise your hand and hold it high for a moment? Your way of saying, I'm saying yes to the gift that he paid for me to receive today. So good. I see your hands. Is there anyone else? No one's going to grab your hand. No one's going to do anything weird to you. This is your invitation to be forgiven of sin and start a relationship with the God of love that can start today and last forever. Is there anyone else? say, God, thank you for what you've done for me. I want to know you. I want to be in relationship with you. I want to know your love. And I admit that I've sinned. I know that I need to be forgiven, and I'm asking, would you please forgive me today? Jesus, I, I believe that you came, died, and rose. I believe that you are Lord and you are Savior. Today, I'm putting my trust in you to be my Lord my Savior. I relinquish lordship over my own life. You be my Lord. I relinquish self-righteousness. You be my Savior. Please forgive me and come and live in my heart. I want to know your presence. I want to know your love. And I want to love you in return with all my heart. Thank you, Lord. And church, we're going to close with a song of worship together. But if you're still in this place of praying, God, break through. I want to receive your love. I would encourage you, come to the altar. Come and lay down deservingness and ask to receive his love. As pastors, we're going to go around. We're just going to lay hands and pray. The hearts will be filled with love. Our prayer team's available. You're welcome to head back to the back of the room and receive prayer. If that's what you sense you need at this time for any other reason as well. But why don't we all stand? And as we close out, this service and worship. God, we want to do so, setting you as the prize of our hearts. You are what we want. You are who we want. You are our desire, our heart's ambition, our heart's aim. We set it on loving you. God, we want to be a church and a people where God gets what God wants because we love you because you first loved us. Holy Spirit, empower us in this moment to worship you with all of your hearts and to receive your love that we have more to pour out on your feet. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. This has been a Revolution Church message. 
to access more of this or other message series, visit firstloverevolution.com.